All right, 3.15, time to start. Wednesday afternoon, you've been at this for a couple of days now. The adrenaline level's getting a little lower. We'll try to keep you awake uh, to talk about dedupe in, on Wednesday afternoon. So I want to start with just getting a, a sense of uh, where we are. How many of you uh, saw Brad Anderson's keynote on Monday morning? Quite a few. How many stayed to the end of the presentation and saw the demos that Jeff Woolsey did on Windows Server? Okay, so a bunch of, of uh, hardcore Windows Server fans. Uh, for those of you who did not, we're going to uh, rerun that demo. Uh, for those of you who did see it, we're going to go a little deeper and show you a little bit more about what's going on in, under the covers. Uh, but gave away some of our secret. We have more for you anyhow. Uh, I'm actually a little bit torn. I have two objectives for today. One is that I want to be able to give you some of the under the covers technical glimpse into what's going on with Windows Server uh, deduplication. That's the reason that you typically come to TechEd. And the other is kind of the opposite. I want to make you see how easy it is so that you go run out of here and go try it tomorrow. Well, actually, there's a party tomorrow, so maybe try it uh, uh, when you get home. Uh, the, the point of this is we're going to show you how to save money, and it's, it is quite easy. Uh, let's see if we can get to the next slide. So by now, since most of you were at the keynote, you've heard about Windows Server 2012 R2. Uh, we're going to talk both about Windows Server 2012 deduplication and the changes and enhancements that we're doing in the R2 version. Uh, the, by now, I assume that some of you, have, or most of you, have seen something of the other capabilities that are, that are in uh, Windows Server 2012 R2, there's a big focus uh, on being able to reduce the capital and the operational costs for your data center. So we're going to talk about that. Uh, it's about enabling that for cloud providers, whether it's an on-premise private cloud, hosted cloud service provider, with these areas of focus, reducing costs, to build cloud scale services, you have to have the performance, the scalability, the reliability and availability that goes with that, and you have to be able to manage the whole thing at scale. So, uh, in particular, we're gonna talk about the storage part of that. Storage is changing in the industry. Uh, for a long time, it was uh, fairly stable. Uh, Microsoft server applications tended to use uh, storage arrays, and that was what we recommended. That's uh, basically all that uh, the server applications and uh, things like Exchange and SQL Server uh, supported. But there's some significant trends and changes happening in the storage industry, some of them that uh, we're trying to help lead and help push. Uh, the one that we're going to talk about today is about options that can help decrease the costs and TCO costs, both the, the capital purchase costs and your operations and management costs for high performance, scalable data center storage. There's other things that are going on, some other sessions that uh, talk about some of the other uh, issues on here. Customers are actually moving uh, more data to the cloud. That's been talked about for a long time. It's becoming a reality as people actually do that. And there's more, that enables a set of services that can be delivered from the cloud, such as uh, data recovery services and storage management. But you came here to talk about deduplication. So why do we talk about deduplication? This isn't a new chart. I'm sure that you've all seen this or some version of this. IDC has been talking about it for years. Data is growing. The data storage costs are growing because although the, 
costs per gigabyte of disks has been coming down. It hasn't been coming down fast enough to deal with the uh, increasing and accelerating rate of change in the amount of data that has to be stored. And the amount of data drives another set of costs around operations, backup, archiving, data management, a whole set of things that drive up your TCO. So since this isn't new, anybody have any questions about, whether, about this? Is anybody in this group uh, expecting that you'll need to buy more storage capacity over the next year? I thought so. Anybody that would like it if you actually could get some of that for free? I thought so too. So we're going to talk about how you might do that. So Windows Server 2012 data du deduplications. We're going to start with what's in 2012. Uh, it's out. It's usable. I talked to a few of you before the session started who are already using it. But this is just to give us a, a bit of an overview on what uh, the deduplication architecture is for Windows Server. So it's a post-processing approach. Uh, the deduplication does not sit in the right path. So we don't try to take the file as it comes in, do all of the processing on it, deduplicate it, and put it down into a deduplicated store while the application is waiting for that write to uh, complete. So we do it after the fact. Deduplication jobs identify files. There's a chunking algorithm that goes through, uh, picks the, the right place to break the files. It's not a fixed size. It's a variable uh, size that's, that's based on a research algorithm. So we pick this, those uh, breakpoints and then identify the common files. And then those, those chunks get pushed down into a chunk store. And as you can see here, there's a, a repository of the individual chunks. And then there's a set of stream uh, maps that point to the list of, of chunks. And then we replace the file itself with a, re a uh, stub file that points into the deduplication chunk store. So what you end up with is you remove the original files, and now you have pointers, and files have become metadata, the same metadata that the file system metadata that existed on the original file is applied to the stub file in the file system. But effectively, you've turned it into metadata and an ordered list of pointers into a chunk store. So that's dedupe 101, a little bit basic. Many of you may already know all of that, but it's going to be important because we're going to come back to some of those principles as we talk about some of the implications of how you deploy. All right, so as we went about building deduplication, there were some design principles that we used. Uh, the first one was we wanted to make it simple. Simple to use, simple to deploy. So it's almost, not quite, but almost, you go to the volume, you turn on dedupl, you accept the defaults, and you're done. We're going to tell you about some of the caveats of things that you can change, but literally you can go turn it on, accept the defaults, deduplication starts working. Easy optimization rules. So there are some knobs. We'll give you some knobs. Uh, the primary ones are there are a set of files that you may want to exclude. There are some that we recommend that you exclude, some that we will uh, exclude uh, by default. Uh, you can set the time after which the file is written before we'll come back and process that file for deduplication. So in server 2012, it was a V1 product. We didn't have any significant experience other than a few pre-release uh, TAP customers that helped try it out. But we didn't have widespread customer use. And so we wanted to make sure that we were on the conservative side. We set the 
the default time to five days. What, what that meant is that it was five days after you wrote the file before the DDU process, optimization process, would come along and say, oh, that file's five days old. I can now uh, process that, do the chunking, and uh, put the file into the, the chunk file and replace the original file. In 2012 R2, we've got enough experience and uh, some of the things that we'll talk about today that the defaults now move down to three days. You can actually set that uh, even lower. The third design principle was this was deduplication for active storage. It was deduplication of the storage on a Windows server. That meant that it's not sitting on the side, coming in and trying to deduplicate uh, the storage on another server. It runs on the server that actually has the storage attached to it. And it also meant that it needed to be transparent to the workload so that the server who's doing the work, uh, whether that's a file server or a, any other server, can um, continue to operate and not have dedupe get in the way. It's designed also to make sure that it's the background process. If the server needs additional resources, dedupe will back off, uh, let the files just get written to, to the disk, and the optimization can lag behind. Typically, in most uh, deployments, you have some times in your cycle where the, the load is less, whether that's on uh, evenings or weekends or, or uh, other designated times, but typically you're, you don't have the highest peak load all the way through the entire week. So there's times when DDoP can catch up. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, we started with this principle. We can't lose data. It's, the data is the sacred trust that uh, the customers give us, that data, and surprise, surprise, they want it back. They want it back the way they gave it to us. All right, so let's take a look now at what does that mean? We've, done, we've talked about how we deduplicate files. So let's take an example of what this looks like after you uh, do the deduplication. So if you start with a volume that has 10 terabytes on it before deduplication, you apply the process we talked about, you end up with, after deduplication, there will be some files that we're on that exclusion list. Uh, some files that, uh, depending on, well, in Server 2012, we didn't optimize any open files. So if the file was open, uh, we wouldn't optimize it. So there's some files that are still unoptimized. But then there's a chunk store. There's a set of the file stubs for the optimized files. You end up with a significant savings because the the chunk store and those stubs takes less than the, the uh, original physical lo uh, amount of storage. So your logical amount is 10 terabytes, but your physical storage in this example is, is uh, two terabytes, an 80% savings. What kind of savings can you actually expect? Well, uh, if you have 80% capacity, what does that mean? It means you're saving on the hardware cost. Uh, it also means that you're saving on the, the TCO, the management cost, the backup. There's less data to move around, particularly if you're, um, the applications that work with it, or your backup application can handle optimized backups. You have much less data to move, shorter backup times, shorter uh, downtimes in Windows. All right, so what, what could you expect? So we tried this out on some different workloads. And a typical uh, information worker home folder uh, sits on a file server and there's a bunch of those. If you deduplicate those, you typically get something around 25 to 35%. A general file share, where there's sharing among uh, different people uh, and different kinds of documents, Turns out it gets better than that. T typically runs 45, 50, 55%. There's some specific scenarios that tend to work even better. 
One is a software deployment share. So if you have a place uh, such as Microsoft, we build Windows every day, and we build multiple versions of that. So we have lots of different versions, and there's lots of commonality in those. Uh, we tend to get very good uh, deduplication rates on that, up around the 70 to 80 percent. But the one that turns out to be uh, most interesting uh, from what customers tell us is VHD libraries. They deduplicate really well. We've seen 90, even as much as 95 percent deduplication savings on VHD libraries. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Giri, who is uh, the uh, senior test lead uh, for deduplication. And he's going to show us what that looks like. You've seen the graphs, the charts. He's going to show you what it actually looks like on the, the server. Thanks, Gene. So uh, let me show you an example of uh, the kind of savings that we see in case of uh, VHD libraries. So I here have a VHD library onto which various uh, OS VHD images are stored. Now, if you see the uh, total size of these files. You need to switch. <laughs> OK. Let me start over. So uh, I have a VHD library here uh, on, onto which various uh, OS VHD images are stored. If you see the total size of these files, uh, it's around uh, 80 GB. This is actually the logical file size, uh, logical size of these files. But let's see what's the actual on disk size of these files. For this, I'll uh, bring up the uh, volume properties. You'll see here uh, the actual use space on this disk is around uh, 10 GB. So in this case, DDP has saved you about uh, 70 GB of uh, disk space, uh, which is in line with uh, what you saw on the slides. Uh, the reason for uh, seeing such high space savings in case of VHD libraries is uh, due to a couple of things. One, uh, uh, OS VHDs tend to have similar OS uh, binaries in them. And two, uh, DDoop actually compresses the unique chunks before it uh, saves into the uh, chunk store, giving you additional space savings from uh, compression as well. So once these files are deduplicated, the access to the files are uh, transferred to the user or the application. All right. So. So far, that's all things that you can do with Server 2012. And when we would talk to customers and show them this and say, here's your VHD library, and we get great deduplication savings on that, what do you think the first thing they asked was? Why? That's great. It's nice that I have my libraries there, but I want to actually run my VHD files from that. So for Server 2012 R2, uh, we decided that we would go tackle that problem. To do that, uh, if you're going to be able to run those, you'd have to be able to uh, turn on optimization on a library where you have running VHDs. You have to be able to optimize the running file while the file is open. Uh, and then you have to be able to make sure that the uh, VM can keep running while deduplication is going on underneath. So, Gary, what does that look like if we try to do that on the, the libraries? So, let's try it out, uh, Gene. So, um, I have here uh, running a uh, VM, which is quite responsive to the user. I'll just start a video on this. Uh, the VHD for this VM resides on this volume. Uh, let's quickly look at the file properties of uh, this VHD. So you'll see here that the size uh, on disk and uh, the logical size are the same. So one, uh, one way to know if a file is deduplicated, you can actually look at the uh, uh, size on disk. If the size on disk is less than the logical size, that basically means uh, DDP has uh, processed that file and moved the chunks to the uh, chunk store. So in this case, this file is not deduplicated. Now I'll show you how to enable deduplication and run uh, deduplication on this volume. For this, I'll uh, switch to server manager UI. So this is the volume on which uh, the uh, VHD resides. You can right click on this and select configure data deduplication. In this drop down, you have a uh, couple of options. Uh, to enable data deduplication, you need to select uh, virtual desktop uh, infrastructure server. You select this and then click OK. 
That was pretty no, it's, easy. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Now it's as simple as uh, this to enable uh, uh, live deduplication. I'll give it a couple of seconds uh, for it to finish. Uh, basically, the process of deduplication. Once you enable uh, deduplication, uh, it uh, it's scheduled to run periodically in the background. But uh, for this demo, I'll uh, not wait for it to uh, uh, wait for the scheduled task to kick in. I'll uh, manually launch it once this is done. Yeah. You could have a little so, network connectivity uh, bandwidth issue. <laughs> so here is the command to uh, enable uh, deduplication, or uh, basically run deduplication uh, from PowerShell. So the process of deduplication, we call it as optimization. Uh, once you have used uh, Windows Server 2012, uh, you would be familiar with this uh, term. So let me uh, start. Uh, so. I've kicked off uh, the uh, deduplication. Uh, DDP is processing this file in the background. Now let's go back, uh, look at the uh, uh, VM. Uh, you'll see that uh, the VM continues to respond while uh, DDP is processing this file in the background uh, with uh, no impact to the user. So the process of deduplication takes like few uh, minutes. So I, I don't want to wait for uh, that to complete. So I'll switch to a completely uh, deduplicated uh, VM. Here is a completely deduplicated VM, and uh, you'll see that this VM, again, still uh, continues to be responsive as it was before without any uh, impact to the user. And uh, the VHD for this uh, VM uh, resides on uh, this volume here. Now let's look at the file properties for this uh, VHD. So as I mentioned, if a file is deduplicated, the size on disk will be much uh, less than the uh, logical file size. This is an indication that the uh, chunks, the file was processed and the chunks of this file is uh, now moved to the uh, chunk store. By the way, if you notice, this volume is on a cluster shared volume. Okay. Now, if you're curious to know what happened to the volume uh, on which we enabled deduplication, uh, let's uh, quickly go back to that volume and see what uh, has happened. Of deduplication. So usually it takes some time. Uh, let's look at the file properties. This is the volume on which we uh, enabled deduplication earlier. I'm going to right click on this file properties. So now, if you see, the size is already reduced. So, okay, let me just clear this. This is the logical file size. You can see that DDP has already processed this file. DDP commits partially commits every time it uh, does like one gig. It has already moved uh, this data. So this uh, shows you that uh, the VM is running. DDP is able to deduplicate the uh, VHD. So there's going to be a lot of questions. I'm going to ask you to hold it till the end. We're going to try to finish so that we have time at the end. But I think we may answer many of the questions that you have with some of the other slides. So uh, hold on. So. What did we just see? We saw deduplication now supporting live VHDs for VDI. All right, let's hear it for that. That's what you asked for. I think we got our thunder stolen. So what did that take? Yes, uh, dedupe working on CSV. That was probably the number two ask that we got from customers uh, after we released uh, deduplication on server 2012. They wanted uh, deduplication to work with CSV. It was a new technology that we used to enable scale out file servers, to enable uh, uh, clustered access to uh, data in parallel. So now, yes, it works on, C on CSV volumes. Number two, all right, where is clicker working. There we go. Number two, we have to be able to optimize the file while it's open. And as Gary just showed you, that's part of what we're doing. We'll, we'll walk through under the covers what happens during that process. Third, we need to have enough performance. We had to improve the performance for the optimization so that the optimization job itself didn't have to only run at night, run on the weekends. Optimization can happen real time or 
or near real time and keep up with the, uh, the, the I.O. load for a VDI deployment. And then we had to improve the read-write performance to be able to take care of the operational characteristics needed to be able to run that, that uh, VDI. So let's take a look. We talked about CSV. Let's take a look at um, how you deploy this. So I want to be very specific about what's in and what's out. Uh, this is for VDI. There, the next thing that you're all going to ask is, does this work for any uh, VHD file for any VM? The answer is, in this release, that's not supported. Why? We had a short time to get this out. We needed to be able to focus on a scenario that we could validate, test, and make sure that we had high confidence in. VDI is a much more coherent, uh, repeatable workload that we could uh, validate this on. You're more than welcome. There's no technical blocks that prevent you from trying this on uh, any other uh, VM, but you should know it's not a supported scenario. You can try it out. You can see your mileage may vary. If you try doing it, we have some caveats we'll talk about later of don't try deduplicating a SQL database, for instance. Uh, but the scenario is VDI, and the, it's specifically VDI over SMB. All right, so why SMB? Well, if, if you put deduplication on the Hyper-V server, you have to put it in the Hyper-V host, and the Hyper-V host has priority over the guest. The Hyper-V host has other things that it has to do that uh, take care of the guests and keep them running. And if you put the dedupe process on that and it gets busy using CPU uh, for computing the uh, cryptography, doing the compression, it's going to take resources away from the host and it'll reduce the uh, ability to run the VMs in the host. The file server, on the other hand, if you're running Hyper-V on server 2012, it runs just fine against SMB as the storage, and it has the capacity to keep up with the deduplication because you're not using the CPU utilization that you need for your Hyper-V guests. So required is SMB3 remote connection, network storage. Recommended is that uh, you put this on a scale-out file server. Scale-out file server for, how many of you know what scale-out file server is in server 2012? For those of you who don't, we, cre we introduced a new um, file server type in server 2012 that allows uh, sitting on top of clustered shared volumes, so it's a clustered file server on CSV every node in the cluster can access all of the data on any of the CSV volumes, and a client can come in from uh, the Hyper-V host in this instance, can come into any one of those nodes with some new work that uh, Jose talked about yesterday, or was it, maybe it was Monday. Uh, we can now balance that uh, automatically across multiple hosts on a, a per share basis. So we recommend putting this on a scale-out file server. If you go create a file server, the wizard will just ask you, do you want a general purpose file server or a scale-out file server? So there's a couple of implications that follow from that that I wanted to uh, illustrate for you. So as I said, you can see the data, you can get access to the file on a CSV volume from any node in the cluster. Uh, that means that if you want to see uh, what the data is, you want to see the logical and physical um, information about the, the volume, you want to see what the compression rate is in server manager, you can see that all uh, from any node in the cluster. Go just talk to one of the file server nodes. However, deduplication, remember we talked about it being a um, not in the right path. 
So we have this asynchronous process. There's an optimization process. There's a garbage collection and, comp and uh, compression process that happens in the, the background. Those are jobs that run on a server. Well, it means that they run on one server, not all servers at once. So that we put that job on the server that owns that CSV volume so that there's direct connection from, from that server to the uh, volume and we don't have to do redirection across CSV. That makes it more efficient, but uh, just like any other job on a server, if that, ser that node goes down, the process job that's running on that server is going to go down as well. However, since volumes are self-contained, uh, deduplication, we can see it from any node. All we have to do is go uh, restart that optimization job on the node that picks up ownership of that uh, server, excuse me, of that CSV volume. So now the optimization job has failed over along with the, the volume that it was optimizing. And then if the first server comes back online, we can start up another uh, optimization job on the volume that it owns. All right, so we've talked about CSV. Uh, let's talk a little bit about under the covers on open files. To start, I'm gonna walk you through the process of what happens with a normal file that's not open. So you start with an unoptimized file. It's a stream of bits on disk. We split that into chunks, the variable size chunks, the algorithm we talked about. And then now you have a set of chunks that you can move into the chunk store. Uh, we take all, all of those, once they're into the, the chunk store, we create a reparse point that we put in the file system that points down to the location of those chunks in the file store. And then we remove the main data stream and all that you have left is the reparse point. If the file is open, you start in the same place. The optimization process finds this file. It says, great, I want to, to uh, optimize this file. It chunks it and gets ready to put it into the chunk store. But, oops, something happened. The file's open. Some process writes data into that file. Now you have a file that one or more of the chunks that you were ready to write into the chunk store has been modified. So what do you do? Uh, well, we write, we take the rest of the file and just like we can handle a file that has been optimized and someone goes and writes changes to that after the fact, we'll add, add that change data into the file system and until the optimization process comes along and chunks it up and puts it in the file store, we have some chunks that are in the file store, in the chunk store, and we have the change data uh, sitting in the file system. So we have the same thing here. We have chunks that have been optimized and identified there in the chunk store, and we have some data that's dirty, that's written uh, in the file system. So now we remove the unchanged chunks leave the change data in place, and the next time the optimization process runs, it's going to have uh, the, it's gonna go take that red chunk of, of change data and optimize that, put it into the chunk store. All right, now, let's talk about the issue of performance. So there's a saying that says there's no free lunch. Uh, there actually is free lunch at, at uh, TechEd, but that's not what we're talking about. When you do de deduplication on a volume, there's some work to do. We talked about all the things that are happening. Uh, when you're writing a file, you have to do the chunking. So there's, there's code that works to figure out where the right chunks are. You take those chunks and you compute a hash on it, so there's cryptographic calculations that are being done there. There's taking those chunks and 
Um, as Gary said, we compress them before we write them into the chunk store. And then we have several different places that we have to write information. We have to write the chunks into the chunk store. We have to write the stream maps into the chunk store. We have to write the, the reparse points. We have to wipe out the, the uh, previous data, so we have to change the file system data. So was, there's multiple writes. When you read, you have the same kind of thing. Of you, you now have your file in bits and pieces in the chunk store. You have to go start with the reparse point, find this, the stream map, go get the pieces out of the chunk store, pull them out, decompress them, reassemble them, put in memory so that your calling application can get the original file back. Remember, we said customers and their applications really want the data back the way that they gave it to us. So there's some overhead in all of that. When we looked at the scenario of VDI and what people wanted to do with VDI, the number one worry that people typically have in how does the performance of my system work under load with VDI, they think about the scenario of it's 9 o'clock, Monday morning, my entire workforce is going to come and start up their um, machines during the next 10 minutes or 15 minutes. So we call that a bootstorm scenario. And that's what we're going to show you. What does it look like when you try to start a bunch of VMs all at once? Let me switch to the demo screen. OK, uh, let me uh, go through this demo. Here is the IPOV manager. Here are like two collections of VM that we have uh, created. One uh, is from uh, the DDU volume. The other one is from the uh, non-deduped or the normal volume. We also have a small application that we uh, wrote, uh, which kind of uh, boots these VMs uh, simultaneously. Uh, it, 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 in a sense, uh, simulates the bootstrap. So you're going to start them all at once? It will start all at once, yes. And uh, while this is happening, I actually want to collect some uh, perf counters. Um, I'll start those perf counters. I also have here uh, two VMs, one each from uh, dedupe, uh, normal, and uh, this is the dedupe VM, and this is the normal VM, and this is the last uh, VM from each of these collections. Now uh, let me start uh, booting these VMs. You will see that uh, the sets of VMs from each of these collections uh, start booting, one after the other. So at this point, uh, all the VMs have uh, been started. Uh, let's switch to the perf counter. While uh, I look at the perf counter, you should keep an eye on these two VMs. Uh, move, you, move your app out so you can see it. The, the app. This guy. Zoom it? No, just bring it out, out here. OK. So the, like, uh, the red line here indicates the reads that are happening onto a normal uh, volume, and the uh, green line here indicates the reads that are happening onto a deduped uh, volume. Actually, I want to keep this screen out here so we know when the VMs boot. So this application basically uh, waits until these VMs boot and get the uh, IP addresses. Now you see the deduped VM is already uh, booted and it's on the login screen, and it's slowly getting the IP addresses as well. Once the IP addresses are uh, here, uh, it will stop at that point, uh, saying that all the uh, VMs are booted. So while this uh, VMs boot, uh, let me explain a bit about how access to uh, dedupe uh, file works. When Hyper-V sends a read request to a dedupe file, uh, we have a filter driver that intercepts this uh, read and then uh, redirects the read to the uh, chunk store. In the chunk store, the read gets uh, reassembled and then uh, served back to, the, uh, to Hyper-V. As you would be aware, Hyper-V does uh, unbuffered uh, reads. Uh, basically, that bypasses the uh, system cache. But when uh, dedupe uh, reads the chunks from the uh, chunk store, it reads buffered. Basically, what that does is it uh, caches these chunks in the system cache, or pretty much in the RAM. When there is a read, another read to the same chunk, because of high duplication, the read would, uh, so yeah, pretty much all of these have completed. Let me pause. So when there is a second read uh, that happens uh, for the same chunk, it's uh, served from the uh, chunk itself. So with high uh, deduplication, uh, 
most of the chunks end up uh, residing in the uh, system cache, giving you the uh, benefit of uh, read. So now that's something uh, that you can see here. Now let's look at the uh, perf, uh, the bytes uh, that were read uh, in case of uh, normal. I'll look at the average bytes. It's around uh, 14 million uh, bytes were read in case of uh, uh, normal uh, volume. Now let's look at. So in case of DDP, you would see just uh, just five million. It's like almost like one third of what I would see on uh, normal volumes. Back to you. So not bad. We have deduplication, lower costs, more VMs uh, in a smaller capacity, and better bootstrap performance. So Gary talked about how that works. We just have a little slide here to help illustrate it for you to lock that into your memory. As he said, Hyper-V sends down uh, a non-cached I.O., sends to the file server. The file server passes that on as non-cached I.O. Dedupe intercepts that, uh, handles it as cached I.O., goes to the chunk store, grabs the cache, that it grabs the chunks necessary to uh, reply to that read request. The chunks get stored in system cache, so the next time a read comes that needs that, and in a VDI bootstorm scenario, you're uh, pulling up the operating system image uh, quite a lot. So we have a high cache hit, and as Gary showed you, about uh, one third of the I.O. that actually goes to the chunk store as opposed to uh, getting read out and serviced out of the system cache. All right. So let's talk a little bit about deploying and managing dedupe. There's two scenarios for dedupe. I was talking to someone uh, here just before the session, and they said, well, can I use dedupe on my general file servers? Absolutely. So this is the scenario that we supported and uh, shipped deduplication for in Windows Server 2012, general file servers. Uh, it's transparent access to files. Uh, you manage it. We'll, sh we'll show uh, some of the details about how you manage it. Uh, but for information worker and general file servers, that it works just fine. It's not uh, in this deployment mode, not uh, deduplicating the open files. It's just doing what we described before, going through on a periodic job basis and optimizing the files. You set the parameter of how long you want them to be aged out. It's a trade-off between how much resources you use on optimizing a file that might get changed uh, over the next few days. There's a couple of other interesting things about this scenario. Because deduplication for Windows Server uses the same chunking and hashing algorithm we've integrated with uh, branch cache, so that if you have branch cache enabled, and how many of you have have used or, or deployed branch cache in a remote office? Not very many. Um, but for those of you who have, you know that it optimizes the download, particularly across a high latency WAN connection. But if the, when the first read comes up, uh, it's going to initiate the uh, calculation of the hashes. So you don't actually get benefit from uh, branch cache until the second read. If you use deduplication, dedupe will have already processed those files. It will have pre-calculated the hashes and chunks so that the first download gets sent down as chunks and populated in the branch cache cache on the either the peer, it operates in a peer mode or a hosted mode, it, the chunks can get populated. So you start getting benefits from branch cache earlier with deduplication turned on on the file server. The second deployment view, of course, is VDI that we've been talking about. And in this case, uh, the thing that I wanted to call out for you here is that the Hyper-V uh, compute, typically it's a cluster, but not necessarily, 
uh, it does not actually need to know anything about deduplication. It needs to be server 2012, so it can use SMB3 uh, to talk to the file server, but it can be server 2012. You don't have to update your Hyper-V servers in order to be able to use dedupe for the VDI scenario. All right, I promised that I'd give you some step-by-step -step, uh, information here on how to use this. In fact, I really want to show you how easy it is uh, so that you want to go out and try it. So what I'm going to try to do here is give you the everything you need to know to go deploy and try out dedupe in two slides. Here goes. So, oops, I already got there. First, first step in, in any deployment is you figure out what you want to do. Identify your servers, look at the, the volumes you want. The important thing here, and we'll, I'll, uh, I have a slide where I'll tell you where to find this, uh, there's an evaluation tool. You can point to your volume, and before you actually turn on deduplication, it will tell you what kind of savings you'll get. So you can check it out if it gives you really uh, bad results because you have a particular workload that uh, the data isn't compressible and is, doesn't have much duplication in it, you'll know that and you won't need to, to turn it on to try it out. Second, uh, you turn it on, you enable it. You saw Geary do it with, in the UI. Uh, you can do it in PowerShell. You go to the Windows Server uh, Manager and it's a sub-role under the Windows file server. Just turn on the deduplication role, and then you go to the volume, and either with the UI or with PowerShell, you enable deduplication for that volume. That's it, the PowerShell is right here. Um, enable dedupe volume D colon. Pretty hard. You can change the policy about how long the file, how old the file is before we operate on it, uh, change policies about the, the uh, filters for which kinds of files. Then you optimize it. You can just wait. We'll run the process in the background. You can kick it off like Geary did by starting an optimization job. All right, so what's different about VDI? Well, almost nothing. <laughs> There's one flag. Uh, when you enable dedupe for the volume, you tell it that you want to do it in uh, the usage type Hyper-V. That will tell us to use the optimizations for uh, Hyper-V and open files. There's one other thing you need to be aware of as you're planning and thinking about uh, turning on deduplication for uh, VHD files. It's typically in a file server scenario, you've got a file server, you've got data, Turning on deduplication just makes your uh, data compress and you have more free space. If you're going to try to set up a VDI deployment, typically you start with a server and then you start trying to put VHDs on it. The whole goal is for you to put, be able to put more VHDs on it than you have physical capacity for. So there's a little bit of a chicken and egg thing here. Uh, we don't have this fully automated, and you're going to say, why can't you make this easier for me? We've heard that. We're going to do more of that in the future. But right now, you need to copy the files on till your disk gets uh, some reasonable percentage of full, run the dedupe job manually, copy on some more. You can easily do it in uh, PowerShell script, uh, but it, you, you will be putting more uh, data on that volume than you will have capacity for until dedupe gets a chance to do its thing. So that's how you get it set up. Managing deduplication. So there's a uh, monitoring. You can get the status. There's a couple of PowerShell commands there uh, telling you how to get the, the volume information, the status, and get information about the job. These log events uh, for corrupted files if it finds any in the process. And then uh, how do you maintain it and troubleshoot it? You can 
launch an ad hoc job, just like we talked about in the process of getting your VHD files on. You can manually run the uh, garbage collection and the scrubbing job. The scrubbing job goes through all of the files and verifies that all of the data is uh, intact and correct. We'll come back to that in just a minute after we show you one more surprise. You can unoptimize a volume. Here again, there's a caveat. We give you the, the command to do this, but if you've got 10 terabytes of logical data on a two terabyte drive, it's not going to succeed. <laughs> so you have to make sure that you have, when you do the actual unoptimization of the full volume, you have to make sure that you have the capacity to be able to hold the logical uh, amount of data that you have there. So you may have to copy data off uh, and then delete uh, in order to be able to get the drive in a condition where you can actually do the unoptimization. All right. Uh, caveats. What's, what doesn't work? Uh, boot volume, system volume, FAT drives, and REF, REFS drives are not supported with deduplication. The drives have to be attached to Windows Server. A remotely mapped drive doesn't count. If it's attached as in a um, SAN array connection with fiber channel so that it looks like a local drive to Windows Server, uh, you can do that. Uh, typically, people who use SAN arrays are often using the deduplication on the hardware. Uh, you'll ask, can I do both? Yes, it's possible to do both. We haven't seen any problems with it. In fact, a couple of customers say they, get a, they eke out a little bit of additional percentage of, of improvement. Uh, but if you don't have the hardware array, it's probably not worth the, the cost delta. Uh, but in terms of will dedupe operate, as long as it looks like a local drive uh, to Windows, it will. Don't put deduplication on the Hyper-V host. So VMs that are on the Hyper-V host, you don't want to use uh, deduplication on. That includes if you're using exposing those up through CSV directly connected into the Hyper-V host. As I mentioned before, SQL uh, databases, exchange uh, stores make extremely bad candidates for deduplication, and they have lots of churn from the random uh, I.O., so those are not supported. And then there's some files that just don't make any sense or that we skip. If it has extended attributes, we don't support that. Encrypted files, we skip. We don't uh, deduplicate encrypted files. If it's smaller than the minimum size that it makes sense to put into the chunk store, it would just be one chunk, and so we don't deduplicate those. And if it's a reparse point that's not a, a Windows Server deduplication reparse point, we won't uh, process those as well. And finally, deduplication is only on Windows Server. It's not on the Windows client SKU. All right, just a couple of other considerations here. Uh, upgrade and migration. So it's always okay to move or copy a file. It, it's just an operating system call. Uh, it comes down, the deduplication filter manages getting you back the file and giving it back in the original case. So you can move and copy files all day long. Uh, you can get access to deduplicated files uh, remotely from SMB, from any version of Windows. You can move a volume that's been deduplicated in Windows Server 2012 and attach it to a Windows Server 2012 R2 machine. That works fine. Don't go the other way. That's not supported. You can't move from R2 back to an earlier version. You can't move from 2012 back to 2008 R2. Deduplication doesn't exist on 2008 R2. And a couple of notes about backup. I assume that most of you are IT pros. Uh, I know that there's at least one uh, backup vendor in the room. Uh, the bottom line here is gonna be 
ask your backup vendor. There's some things that can go dramatically wrong if a backup is done the wrong way. So again, it's always possible to go backup and restore individual files. We'll handle giving the, uh, the file back in its original form. And when you restore a, an individual file, it writes it into the file system. We see that as a modification of the file, overwrites what was there before, and we go ahead and, and process it. You can also do a full volume backup. If you take the volume itself, including both the file system that has the stubs and the chunk store. But as you might imagine, if you think about it for a minute, you can't back up just the reparse points by themselves or the chunk store by itself. You get bad results. If you bring back a reparse point uh, from some time ago, it may now point to chunks that don't exist uh, if you bring back the chunk store, the reparse points may not point into the right places, so you can get yourself in a really bad situation. It's possible to do uh, backups where the backup uh, application just asks for all the files, copies them all off, and a restore brings them all back as individual files. You'll have to make sure that you paste that so that, that uh, you don't have more data on that volume than you have space for during the process. It's also possible to do optimized file level backup and restore. We have a VSS writer. As I said, the bottom line is on backups, ask your backup vendor. Make sure that uh, they are aware of Windows Server deduplication and do the right thing. All right. So let's recap. We've talked about open files. Uh, how we handle that, and the CSV support needed to be able to do VDI. We talked about some of the specific scenario limitations, what you can do and what you shouldn't do. Uh, we've looked at some of the performance enhancements around the bootstorm scenario, and we've talked about how to manage and deploy and get this thing up and running. So we have one more demo for you. When uh, Brad stole our thunder, we uh, went back and said, what else can we show? And we thought about uh, what is the next most important thing for folks thinking about VDI. Well, mostly what people tell us is when they're planning VDI, their most important metric is how do I get a density in my VDI deployment? How do I get the most number of users supported on the fewest uh, number of machines, fewest number of racks? So we've... Um, we haven't finished this, but we wanted to show you a little demo of what happens if you take the VDI support for deduplication and put that on a different type of storage subsystem. And Gary's going to show you a demo of doing that with an SSD disk. Here, uh, I have uh, two volumes created out of SSD. So one is uh, deduplicated, and the other is uh, non dedup volume. So what we try to do here is to see how many VMs we can cram into each of uh, these volumes. So now, uh, let's see how many I was able to add. And uh, let me let's go back. So I could actually put in around uh, five VMs before I ran out of this space uh, on this volume. The VM size is around eight gigs, and I couldn't add another one. So now let's see how many uh, we could uh, add in uh, DDU volume. Any guesses on how many we could add? Numbers? Was it? OK. 26. 26. Let's see. OK, let's see. I think you are close. 50 VMs. Are they like 50 uh, VMs. Can you actually run them? On Let's the see. If Let's we can take a look. actually run them without impacting uh, the user response. So let me open up uh, Hyper-V Manager for that. See, here you can see that uh, all the VMs, uh, the 55 VMs are running on the system. 
right now what i did is uh, i bought like two vms here one which is uh, deduplicated vm the other is uh, a non deduplicated vm uh, let's do something uh, simple here Let's switch to another VM which let's give it a second. Network connectivity back to the West Coast has been a little interesting this week. This doesn't seem to be Well, by the way, this is not a deduped VM. Exactly. So He's having a problem with the non deduped one. Let's give it another try. Okay. Come up. So, well, non deduped volume uh, VM uh, decided to not to come. Okay. So, it eventually came. Probably this is a good example too. If you see uh, the dedupe uh, VM, which is like around five, 50 of them running instead of uh, five, I just initiated a copy here. Oh, it completed the copy. Okay. It started copying. Uh, at least it's much uh, responsive uh, than uh, the normal uh, VM. Anyway, it's too late now. So what I was uh, planning to show is uh, copy on both these VMs. And uh, you would see that dedupe VM, in spite of uh, 50 VMs running, uh, the copy completes earlier than the uh, normal VM. But we're not done with this release. Uh, typically, in the last uh, few months before we finalize it is the time that we really focus on performance, testing, validation of some of these things. Uh, so we aren't completely there, uh, but this, I think, illustrates that there's a potential here for really changing the game for VDI, where you now have the ability, because you can use deduplication on the VHDs, you now have an application that can consume the IOP characteristics of SSDs, uh, puts it in a different class. Uh, that lets you if you have a 10 to 1 ratio, it gets you in a position where uh, the cost difference goes away. And now you can uh, condense the amount of rack space it takes, the heating, cooling, uh, energy costs, and increase the density. So I think we, uh, as I said, we have a, uh, some things to do. Uh, we haven't yet really worked through this on the tiered storage that the uh, file system guys have done but in storage spaces with tiered storage, with SSD tiered to, uh, to spinning media, we think there'll be some really interesting things that you can do around density with VDI deployments. All right, we're almost out of time. There's a couple of other things I wanted to, to talk about. One's really important here, reliability and data integrity. So how many of you use RAID? What's a RAID about or mirroring? It's about taking your data and making extra copies of it in case something goes wrong. Deduplication does the opposite. We take your data and get rid of all the extra copies, or most of the extra copies. Uh, so if we do that, it multiplies the risk. It's like highly leveraged investment. So uh, if we lose data, uh, it can have a very significant impact. If you lose a chunk, and it can be from a uh, hardware issue, it can be from software. If you lose a chunk, it can have a, a very significant impact. And RAID and backup can't stop all of those. So what do we do about it? First of all, deduplication has built-in detection. We do a checksum validation for integrity on every piece of data and metadata in the dedupe store. Uh, 
You can get some of that with REFS, uh, but it, it's not there in NTFS. We added on top. Secondly, when there's higher risk, like there's chunks that are used by lots of uh, files, we keep extra copies of those, and we keep extra a second copy of all the metadata. Then we have a process that goes around and looks at all of that and makes sure that everything's still matching the checksums and the data is what it should be. And if it finds corruption, it tries to fix it. Uh, we have the ability to repair it from whatever data that we can find. Uh, one way we can find that is that uh, we've kept an extra copy, like we talked about in the, the redundancy section. Another way we can repair that is if you're sitting on spaces, space, mirrored spaces, for instance, uh, we can ask spaces, give me two copies. Spaces can't tell which one is the right one, but we can. So we can repair based on, on spaces. And the one I think is actually uh, pretty interesting is that if we can't repair it with either of those, uh, we won't get rid of the file. We'll sit around waiting. And if we ever see another chunk that matches the same hash, we'll actually repair your old file with the new chunk. So we, we really go out of our way to try to make sure that we can give you back that data. Finally, I told you I uh, would talk about this ddupe evaluation tool. Install the role. Uh, then it's ddpeval.exe. You can run it. Uh, it'll tell you what the expected deduplication will be on a particular volume. This tool will run against a local volume. It'll run against a remote volume over SMB. So you can actually run it on another server and, and see what uh, deduplication rate you'd get there. It runs on Windows 7 or newer on a client, and it runs on uh, server 2008 R2 or newer on the server side. So it doesn't actually have to be a 2012 or uh, 2012 R2 server. All right. Uh, just to wrap up, cost-effective storage. We can save uh, space and save you money. The part in white is text uh, that describes what was available in Server 2012. The dark uh, green is the new capabilities in R2, adding capability for storage, high-density storage for VDI, support for open files and CSV volumes. It's transparent to the server workload, now supporting BDI transparently as well. All the availability and, real, and data integrity that I just talked about is available in both versions. It was important for V1. And uh, the storage and network savings, we talked about branch cache, and you saw the example of how we can improve the storage performance in the bootstorm scenario for VDI. So with that, we are done, and they're about to turn the red light on us. There's some track resources. You've seen some of these before. And please do the evaluation. Uh, it matters. It helps us get feedback on what uh, we can do better. Thank you very much. We'll be around for questions. Uh, actually, uh, we'll take questions. Are we out of time? We'll, we'll stick around and answer questions uh, up front or out in the hall. <laughs>